Welcome to Off Watch, our weekly interview series. A lot of you are asking to hear from Xabi Fernandez, the Spanish sailing legend. So I sat down with him and asked him about that partnership with Ica Martinez that was forged in those early years in the Olympics. Then that first step into the ocean race back on the VO70, into the development of the VO65 and the last edition. What did Mafre do right? What did they do wrong? And what was going on on board the Spanish boat in that final crucial leg into The Hague that wrapped up the final scores. Now, if you enjoy this interview, you can leave us a review. And of course, we are always taking suggestions as to who we should be talking to next. Enjoy. Xavi Fernandez has been in every edition of the Ocean Race since joining Movistar back in 2005, representing Spanish hopes for their first race win. He is a relentless campaigner, with three appearances at the Olympic Games, walking away once with a silver medal and once with a gold. Now, if you throw in three World Championship wins in the 49er, you begin to see why his resume is hard to beat. But... Shabby, you know, with all of that said, there's also a little bit of an enigma about the way you sail because fans of the race have always described you as quite modest and as a skipper, you're never seen on the helm. We always find you head down, working on the pumps, working on the winches. You seem quite happy to let other people in your team enjoy the limelight. I wonder, is that a fair description of you? Do you prefer the sailing? And do you just dislike doing interviews like this? <laughs> well, well, of course, we prefer the sailing, all of us, I think. Oh, every people, uh, everyone sails with me. But uh, I think uh, with the last point you mentioned, uh, which is very clear, is when, when you have someone, someone in the team or in the board which uh, can make a better job than you, you just need to let them do it, you know? And I think uh, we share everyone... In, a, in an ocean race, it's time for everything, and we all share most of the things. But uh, of course, we had, uh, for example, in the last mafia, we had three specialists which uh, drove much more than the others. I mean, you're right about your resume probably doesn't put you as a helm, but it's also your ability to to stay quite grounded. I mean, let's let's go back to 2004. So this is your 28. You go to the Athens Olympic Games and you put in, I mean, a hell of a performance. Eight races in the top five out of 16. Uh, it's a really strong performance. It looks pretty good on any scorecard at all. That must have been a good launch pad to, well, I mean, go anywhere from there. Mm, well, uh, Athens for, for Iker and me in the 49er was uh, for sure the best, uh, you know, the best years we have since uh, 2001, 2003, where, you know, we had big fights actually with, uh, especially with uh, British uh, 49er sailors, but, uh, but uh, with, with few boats, but uh, really they were our years, you know, it's, I, I don't want to dare to compare to to Peter and Blair, but you know, we had this kind of years where we won so many races one after the other and, and we went to Athens, uh, you know, probably being favorites and, and, you know, we have to go there and win. And, and as you say, we, we did the almost perfect Olympics, right? Uh, so, you know, this, this years where really things were aligned and we had a good team around us as well with, with our coach, with the Federation, and we were very well organized and, and things happened very, very nicely. From there, obviously, you know, we, we kept going with the 49er, which we, we still did, you know, very good years, but always harder. And especially China Olympics in, in Qingdao, they were very hard for us in, in a place with no wind. And, and we had to basically learn sailing with, with no wind, which was far from our speciality. And, and for sure, after Athens, we, we start going to to the ocean with, you know, with Movistar, with Bauer, with, with Chris Nichols, with so many people we sell, uh, you know, around the world a couple of times later. Well, you mentioned Chris Nicholson. I mean, the thing that I found really amusing when I was looking through some of the old results is from the Athens games, you've got, uh, you mentioned the British, Chris Draper, he's there at that games. And obviously with Luna Rossa, uh, there's, uh, you know, a crossover there later on in your sailing career. Chris Nicholson as well, on board Movistar. We need to touch on that boat. 
not least because it was a, a 70. It was uh, a bit of a step up. And I think there's an important point about why we end up with the VO65s because, you know, the 70s, almost in that first edition, they showed that they were vulnerable. And of course, Movistar with, with Bauer Becking as the skipper, you know, that tragedy in the transatlantic leg. What was your experience? You've just come into the ocean race. You've just seen it. And now you get a very real taste of what it can do. Your boat sinks. Mm. Well, first, uh, lucky enough, I guess, I wasn't that leg because, uh, you know, I, I I kind of finished that race in, in Brazil and then we went back and came me to the, the foreigner campaign so we could do the Worlds that year. But, uh, but we had a lot of a taste before that anyway because uh, <laughs> both in, in Australia, then we sail on our own from Australia to, to Spain, uh, you know, just training. And that was already a big, you know, big learning and big adventure. We had so many problems. The boat wasn't really ready, but, you know, this time of the year that we go now, we we never go, you know. So few discussions already in, 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 that, um, in that point of the campaign. And then I think uh, we did a very good boat with Movistar. It was, in my opinion, clearly the, the fastest of the far boats. Obviously nothing to do with against the one case from ABM. But, uh, you know, the boat was going well and at the start, you know, having problems, we, we had a big failure in the, uh, in the keel attachment to the boat uh, close to the Cape Horn, where we had a, a really a moment there. We had to stop in Ushuaia and then go to Brazil and then, of course, uh, two legs later across the Atlantic. Finally, this pin failed and, and they had to abandon the boat and obviously sank. So, you know. Big campaign. Uh, the 70s, as you mentioned, they were amazing. I think uh, the guys all, I think, but Iker and me, in that program, everyone did the Volvo before, at least one Volvo before with the 60s. And I don't think they were expecting that, you know, that performance, that power in the, in the Volvo 70s. They were still, you know, trying to push the boats as, as much as they used to push the, the 60s, right? So... So obviously everything was falling apart. And, <laughs> but you know, say that this always happens. Uh, this is one of the. It's nothing to compare because you know the experience of the whole fleet and designers and builders. Everything is much bigger now. But but this is a little bit one of the one of you know question marks we could have in the future going to the sixties, right? Because again, it's open design and, and you have to push the limits to to, to be the fastest. No? But uh, after that, the uh, Volvo seventy edition, the the next two. Again, with the Volvo 70s, they were much more reliable. Still, you know, not as much as the 65, obviously. But uh, the performance of those boats, they were amazing. And if you talk to people, they did the Volvo in the 70s. Uh, you won't find anyone, you know, not talking great things about the Volvo 70s. I remember somebody uh, describing when they'd finished the race on their 70 and they'd found out that their boat was going to be sold. And the sailor said, actually, I don't think this boat should be sold to a private owner. I think this boat should be cut up with a chainsaw because we can barely handle the power. And then if it just goes for a weekend sail. But you say they were a little bit more reliable. I mean, the last edition that you did on the 70s um, with uh, Ika Martinez. Uh, and I want to bring in Ika here because there's a friendship that has to get you know unraveled. It's You guys have been sailing so much. But before I do... That last edition with um, Telefonica, when you guys finished fourth, this was the one where we had dismastings, uh, you know, Abu Dhabi, um, Puma, Team Sanya, I think, had problems with their hull. There was a point where I think it was only two of the boats were sailing on, on one of the legs. My question is, did you see it as inevitable that the race would change in a fundamental way from open design to one design where the structure and the risk could be controlled a bit? Well, I, I don't think, well, I'm not sure, we should probably ask Canut again, but uh, I don't think the real reason from, for changing to 65s were reliability, but, you know, money and budgets going, you know, 
high numbers in a really difficult moment, you know, on the, I guess, economical scale in the planet, you know, like people really struggling to get the budget up and, you know, trying to find something, yes, more reliable. But when, when you go to one design, in my opinion, and, and happened with the 65s for the good and for the bad, is that you go something simpler, something much, much more reliable, and for sure cheaper, yeah, probably, but for sure you win, you gain time. You gain so much time because, you know, design is made and you need to build the ball, which is fairly controlled, the, the amount of time you need for that. And then, you know, off you go and, and sail. Of course, a lot of development, small things you can do and learning. You know, if I always say, if we would say the first Volvo 65 race, two races ago, as we say the last one, you would win every single leg for sure. <laughs> and... You know, all, all the guys selling the 49er now, comparing to the guys selling this, the 49er in the early 2000s, they would win every single race for sure because, you know, they, you develop how you sail and uh, how you prepare the boat. But the thing is, the key thing is the time. That, uh, you know, if you have to design and redesign and refine and build the boat and, and they have some breakages and then the rule is open where you can change and do new sales, et cetera, et cetera, then you need a lot of time, which basically is money. So, you know, it's to me one of the worst things to an open design uh, campaign or, or race is that you need much more time. It, I mean, from a spectator point of view, from a fan point of view, having the one design and having you guys finish, and we will get to Newport later, but having you guys finish within two, three, four boat lengths of each other, it certainly makes it quite exciting. Um, I want to bring in... Um, uh, Ica Martinez at this point. So you guys campaigning together in the 49er, as you say, before that, Athens, this was a partnership that was really strong, delivering with the field that you had, almost unbeatable, certainly favourites. You go and do uh, the Ocean Race, what was then the Volvo Ocean Race. Did you encourage him to come and give it a go because you had one more than him. Then you do uh, uh, the second one with Bauer Becking and Ika's on board. How did he step on board? Well, well, no, we went both together to Movistar after Athens. Oh, okay. Yeah, and we did all the, all the training together. And then uh, finally he did a step in for the racing. Uh, he was involved still in the, in the import races and stuff. And then, as I said before, we went back to the 49er and then after uh, China, and well, before that, actually, with all the design with the Telefonica Blue and Black program, we were involved from day one, and so was him, and, you know, and, and then he stepped in for that Telefonica Blue, and then he skipped for Telefonica. And then, uh, you know, we did together for Mafre, and then, and then the last one, he was involved because he's still campaigning for, for the Olympic sailing, you know. This is, uh, this is one thing, probably, the, the most different between between us in the last year is uh, I for sure I had enough from the Olympics in, in London after London and you know in in his uh, world he's still fighting hard for you know Macros or for whatever is coming from the Olympics. So we had, there's so much that you've just said in two minutes. Olympic campaigns, there's world championships thrown in as well. You've got your dinghy sailing with uh, Ike Martinez, and I'm sure you didn't do that at 50%. I'm sure you did that full on. Did you ever get tired? There's so much sailing in such a short period of time. Well, don't forget the Barcelona World Race, which is... <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. At the, it's the 95, 95 days at sea. Double handed and in Animoca, actually, right? So, and that was for sure the most intense uh, uh, campaign we've done till now. Of course, of course, you get tired. We, we say, <laughs> I, I did as well a few, you know, interviews, and in, I, I don't know, in four or five years, we did the uh, two Olympics, three races around the world, and one America's Cup, you know, and, and, and and two kids and wife and house and you know it's it's a lot going on for for a very short period of time and you know again i think we we've had a lot of fun which is the the 
for sure the most important thing, but, uh, but yeah, we, we manage, I think we manage quite okay to, to do all these things not too bad. And of course we see those moments where, where you realize you're doing too much and you start losing, not losing control, but you know, you, you need to start being careful. Um, let's get to recent history. So the last two editions of the race. Ah. Maybe this is better? Or not? Yeah, perfect. There we go. I mean, you were, you were beautiful before, but you're gorgeous now. Um, so uh, let's get to recent history. Let's get to uh, the two campaigns with, um, with Mafre. Um, the first one that you do, this is the 2014-15 edition of the race um, with Ike Martinez um, being on the helm. You mentioned before that after London 2012, you decided, OK, I'm going to step back from Olympic sailing. I've done that. I'm done. Was 2014-15 the campaign for Ica where he decided I'm going to step away from the race? Not really. I don't think so. I don't think so much. For sure, probably needed a break in terms of, wow, well, I, 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 you know, as far as I'm doing the Olympics, as far as I'm doing the the campaign on some other sailing, I, you know, I can't be one edition not being in the race. Nothing's going to happen to me. But uh, I'm sure this is not the, the last we have seen. Well, because well, of course, as you said, he is in. He was involved in the last uh, Mafre uh, race. So this is 2017-18. Um, with the the start of that race, I just want to. I mean, there is so much to pick apart. One of the things, as I say at the beginning, that you are so well known for and so respected for is your leadership style. Your skipper of the Mafre boat 2017-18, you were skipper occasionally in 1415 when Ica was campaigning. Did you want to be skipper or was it a case of, well, someone's got to do it? Well, it's a bit of everything for sure. When when Pedro got the money, um, Iker again was the fair op first option for for the team, basically because it was uh, pretty much the same structure going ahead. And then, uh, you know, for for him, wasn't the the right time to do it. And then, you know, it's, it's kind of not really escape. You know, we can really play out. And and that's from one side, and for the other side as well. Uh, you know. So many races already being involved and, and closer to, you know, especially when Ike was skippering, you know, being, being very close to, to this part of, of the team. And, you know, I did it, uh, you know, happily. And I think I did it in my way as well in terms of, of trying to, to have good people around me and, and try to let them do. And I think they had a fantastic team last time. Let's talk about some of those good people then. Juan Villa wins the race back uh, on Ilbrook 2001-02. We then don't see him for 15 years on a boat and then back he is with you guys. Uh, what led him to being involved? Well, you haven't seen him. He's been involved non-stop. He's saying uh, <laughs> any of us for sure the last 20 years. He's been involved in... In all the Alinghi campaigns, if I'm not wrong, from there, uh, you know, being navigator on board, you know, winning the cup uh, a couple of times, then going to Oracle for two campaigns, and and Juan has been always, he's, you know, I don't think he's going to listen to this anyway, but uh, he's older than me, so one more generation, let's say, of Spanish sailors, which they sail a lot, and of course I knew him, I knew a lot of him. Uh, he sailed a lot with Pedro Campos and all his structure as well, so he's been always very well known. And for us, he's been always kind of a, a person where, you know, Juan has been always the, the best, right? And not only from our group in Spain, but, you know, all this Alinghi stuff he's done and, and Oracle. So he's been always uh, top of our list, but he's been always so busy that he wasn't able to, to do anything. But the truth is that... Uh, uh, I, I remember I met him in I met with him in in Bermuda one of the trips I did with VAR uh, Reconin and, and obviously they were there with uh, Oracle and and start talking and you know, show great interest to be on board again of the Volvo and, and, you know, and ended up being with us and it's been a super easy to work with and 
you know, so much experience on that. The lineup of your team, I mean, it was very impressive. And I'm sure you take great pride in some of the people that you managed to put around you. There was a wonderful quote that I remember you saying about when the start gun goes and you finally get to leave the dock, you're you almost you're so happy just to go okay all of the drama on the shore you leave now it's just we race but that very first leg that very first harbor course with all the spectator boats in Alicante was so chaotic and i remember the race starting with a three boat jibing well i mean incident incident shall we say did you get a sense at that point that, well, if this is how close we're going to be, if this is how people are going to be fighting for every metre, did you get a sense that it would be those three boats again at the finish, at the end, fighting that close? Did it feel like it was going to be a special year? Well, we knew it would be very, very close because even the edition before, we ended up having very close legs. Uh, as I said before, everything you learn so much from the boats, right? In, you give me a minute, in the edition before 13, 14 or 14, 15, we were in the opposite uh, kind of uh, preparation. We were late, we, the money came, you know, and that's again, as I said before, the good thing of being a one design in terms of, at the end of the day, you can buy the boat and go racing. And you don't need much time. You won't be prepared, but you can be there. And it took us a couple of legs to be on tune. And normally, which is what happens, normally losing these one or two legs is too much and you bring mm. those options to win the, the, the race. What happened this time, which is a thing they changed and I think it was a good thing to do and, and I think we all liked, even probably wasn't the best for the teams we were well prepared, like Don Fan and us, was the double point uh, legs where mm. you know they gave everything to Brunel. Brunel was in a terrible position in Oakland, which is halfway of the race and more than halfway of the points if I'm not wrong or, or, or about that. And and then, you know, obviously he did very well in two double point races and and he was with all the chances to win. If not, he wouldn't be because it really took a little bit too much or too long for them to to be on scene with with you know us or, or Don Fen or, or up there, right? Anyway uh, we knew it would be super tight, obviously not as tight as, as, as it was. And, and the truth is that uh, the teams were well prepared and, you know, we had this damage in the Southern Ocean, but uh, part of that, uh, people didn't have to make damage. It was very hard to, to gain points around the, around the world. Let's take a look at some of that intensity then, because my mind goes to leg three. So this is a double points leg, Southern Ocean, and there was a seven or eight hour stretch where you were doing, you're racing with, with uh, Dong Fong, you're very close, and you did 16 jibes in about a seven or eight hour stretch. And back in race control, we were chewing the numbers on this. That's an, a jibe on an average of 30, 35 minutes. And there was some that you were doing that were only... 11, 15 minutes apart, it, it takes everybody, it takes every crew member on the boat to jibe. You're doing jibes every 30 minutes, 40 minutes maybe. That's, I mean, there's got to be, there's 10 minutes of preparation before the jibe with the stack. There's five minutes, maybe 10 minutes afterwards. And that's a good jibe. How difficult was it to get your sailors, to get your team to go along with that plan? How hard was it to get them out of their bunks? Well, not that hard, I have to say. Not that hard. Everyone, you know, full commitment. No one was on the bunks, of course. <laughs> or full with the gear and on the floor. But, uh, you know, it's, it's tough and you have some, you know, some faces here and there. But uh, everyone was super committed. And no problem. No problem at all. And again, once... First, you're fighting for the win. It's not like you're jiving with no point. And second, when the report came and, and we saw the gains, you know, it's, a, it's such a fast. That, you know, we keep going. and Yeah, but I, I remember very, very well that, that leg. Yeah, a lot of jives in, in, in a day and I'm very happy. I'm sure as the skipper, 
you get to know your sailors and you get to see when they're down and you can be there to pick them up. You'll have people on board your boat who will be there to look after the sails, look after the engine, the winches. Was there anybody on board your boat that was there to look after you? Who did you go and talk to when you were down? Well, seriously, I think uh, I've done kind of all kind of Volvos. Some being very bad from the beginning, and then you have a long way ahead of you. Some which we were fighting for some legs, but you know, knowing really that we couldn't beat Exxon or whatever, which is quite tough. But you you have you small goals, you know, see if this leg which could be good for us or not, and it's more up and down. This time, I think uh, we've been fighting and knowing that we could win the, the race the whole way, where the people has been, you know, very high spirits, myself for sure, and, and everything. Of course, you have good moments, bad moments. I think Patan, Pablo Ararte, uh, or Nieti, they are, you know, friends. They, you know, I think it, and three or four races with each of them, and, and probably is the people I talk the most. But, uh, you know, I think, we, again, we have a very strong group, and one for the other, I think uh, we could be able to, we were able to, to keep the spirits high all the time, most of the time. Well, then let's jump ahead to the next Southern Ocean leg. And, you know, it's another double points leg. Earlier on in the leg, you have a problem with your uh, mast track, which obviously goes on to cause a bit of a big problem. I want to get to that repair. It, it was amazing to see how many decisions you've obviously made to put the right pieces in place so that you could deal with it. But the lasting image, I think, for so many people was that shot from the back of the boat. And I believe you're down on the uh, starboard um, primary winch. And then the main goes, it's torn in half, that's it. At that split second, when you look up and you see the main is now in two pieces, what was the first thought that popped into your mind? Well, the, the thought, the frustration was, oh, we lost this, this leg. It's a major breakage. We have to stop now. All the Southern Ocean, all these days, you know, this discussion on board, we should stop, we should end this better to stop. Everything depends whether. So much pressure on, on, on Juan, because in the two editions before, when we stopped in, in, in there with Telefonica, we stopped for 12 hours with the same rule. But then we, we had the opposite. We had the weather system where they were stopping Puma. And we were coming from behind, gaining you know, 300 miles a day. And actually, we overtook them before the, before the finish line in Itajai and then again in an issue of fight, they, they beat us. But uh, all the pressure was there. If the weather forecast was like this, we could even stop thinking. Uh, think we would even think on stopping there, even if the main wouldn't break completely, because we could think that we could recover these 12 hours. But the, the weather window was terrible and we knew, and Juan was telling us, if we stop, there's no way, because they will go ahead of the front and we will never cross. And that was the, the, the worst thing. So we called them again, they were still there. We did all the repair, 12 hours, go back to the point where we suspended racing, and then, uh, back in. And from there, you know, we, we sail maybe a day or half a day with the main down still, was, was trying on the group. And then we start sailing, it was okay, but we never passed that, uh, that bridge. And then, and then we struggled to get the, to the Italian aid. That was, a, that was a shame. But as a team, you can be very proud of the repair that you made. It was, I mean, I've never done the race and I'm not going to do the race, um, it, but it was amazing to see how prepared a good team is in the race for all these little things that go wrong. So, you know, you had a boat on standby in Ushuaia and obviously they have some things on board. I mean, what could they have repaired? Was it just, okay, if we have a sail breakage? I mean, what were you ready for? Well, as you see, we, we fixed the sail and we glued the, 
we glue the, the track to the mast and we fix the boom. So we have a fair amount of, uh, of you know, both building materials and glue and 5200 and spabond and, and all these things where you can repair pretty much everything, you know. And, and yes, I'm very proud, not myself, the whole team, you know, this is a thing coming from 2011 where we, we had the team that prepared with a piece of the bar, which we blew in Telefonica inside the, <laughs> in 10 hours as well, right? So, so from that lesson, we always had uh, clear that uh, if we go again, uh, even more recent, we, we have a big contingency plans, not only in Cape Horn, you know, a little bit everywhere where, you know, people stand by till Gibraltar, till you leave, and then, and then you always have uh, some plan B to stop somewhere if, if something happens. And, you know, that's why, again, I think this is just to be prepared, you know? And it's exactly, as I said before, very briefly, is what happened in the race before, and then we were penalized. I'm sure it, was, it wasn't what you wanted to happen, of course, and I'm sure it was pretty tough to deal with. Was it nice to be able, as a silver lining, to have a crew meal with everybody uh, all together at one time. Of course, yeah, yeah, that was good because, you know, once you have taken the, the bad part, you at least enjoy the good one, you know? And, and we had a, a fantastic uh, dinner, lasagna in that boat. And, and actually we still keep contact with that uh, crew and, and that was uh, very, very nice. The problem is that we did a mistake because in these 12 hours we could take some extra food for us as well. And then we basically had a delivery to go to Itajai and we basically get run out of, of food a couple of days before. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, made, we made ourselves a little bit, uh, you know, not, not very clever in that moment, but the last thing we were thinking in Ushuaia was to take, take more food. Well, let's move on to the next leg then, which is the one that a lot of people will remember. Um, this is the race from Itajai to Newport. Now, as you're sort of, you know, as you're coming into this, you're 24 hours before the finish, you're in fifth place. Looking at the weather forecast, were you aware that something crazy was going to happen? From there, to thinking on winning the leg, I would be lying if I thought we would be able to win the leg. We had a bad leg because we, got, we broke the, the part of the mast or the sail. And then now we again struggling here in, the, in a tough leg. And, and then when we saw the scenario, oh, we just can still catch up here. I would sign anything, sign a fourth or a third or something like this. And of course, being ahead of uh, on phone. But then uh, when we start sailing uh, close to the harbor or inside the harbor, again, no wind at all. And, and we were just a little bit faster, I think. And we passed one by one, everyone, until we passed Brunel in the finish line, which was... Imagine how hard it would be for the boats they were being passed, you know? Like, for us, was seen, the longer it takes, the better for us. So, so, you know, we were kind of enjoying this, this situation. A lot of maneuvers, again, very light wind sailing and, and the boat moving forward quite well. So I remember passing Don Fen, which was a massive relief that was still outside. And then, and then I don't know if the other boats, but it's amazing when you take a look back at the tracker, which you can still do on the Ocean Race website. And it's almost like people are trying to spell their names in, you know, the trails <laughs> with you guys just sort of going around and everything. Um, when you did cross that line and it was, you had obviously turned what could have been a bad result into a very good one. Brunel had also done well. Did you get a sense then that oh, Brunel is, we're seeing Brunel and Bowie, they're at the front more and more. For sure. For sure. We saw that in, in the Southern Ocean leg as well, not only because they won that leg, but uh, they, I guess they were taking more risk as well and selling, you know, stronger because they had to, but uh, they sell in a very good level. And, and for sure, we knew the potential of the sailors they had on board and, and Bowie himself, because they have KP as well, which is, uh, always uh, safe to have and and we knew we knew for sure that uh, Tom Feng was the, the biggest uh, guy to fight but were you nervous as we got into those final two legs 
because you didn't have one enemy. Now you had two, two boats to look after. Well, of course, but uh, when you have two enemies, the other one has two enemies as well. And it's not a <laughs> uh, one-to-one fight anymore. And, and it's when you have to go back to yourself and say, well, we have to say, well, we have to win this leg to Gothenburg. And, you know, and it was super tricky. That, that race, I have a, that leg, I have a very good memory as well because I think we said very well. A few issues at the beginning, we were behind by Fastnet, but then, uh, you know, we start passing passing the people and for, by the time we were in Scotland we were leading and, and then I don't know one of the moments as well for the from the race is when when Brunel passed us just yeah. hours before the, the finish line it's pure boat speed and, and it was that was tough because we tried absolutely everything we were good few miles behind us and should be job done and and it's not that we relaxed or, or we did a mistake, it was straight line and they were just coming faster. And at the end of the day, that was very, very important, those points as well. It was certainly one of the defining moments uh, of the race. But let's go to the defining moment, the bit. So we get to the final leg. There's three boats, uh, Dongfeng race team, yourselves, Mafre, Team Brunel, who are effectively tied all square on points with Dongfeng race team with this bonus point waiting for lowest elapsed time. Before you left the dock, what were some of the discussions that you were having about how you would sail that leg? Again, again, we had a clear plan in terms of, uh, you know, I think... uh, Positions on board, in, in board positions, you know, everyone training all the time, drivers driving, you know, everything, taking every little shift uh, needed to take and not, not, you know, not being no half an hour rules or one hour rules or these things you sometimes do when you're in the oceans and, and, you know, and try to do our best leg. And then we went to the critical critical moment, which was uh, top of Denmark, and we had to decide uh, in or out. Uh, the truth is our plan from the shore, like it was uh, on France, they told us, Marcel and everything was to go inside, like they did. And we started going down, but uh, what we didn't have in the plan before the start was the, the rough seas. It was super windy again, 30 plus knots, and super choppy. And, you know, and the place where you could go inside the, the wind farm and the land was like five five meters uh, deep mm. moments, and and the last thing we could do is to put any any kind of risk of, of putting the boat in, <laughs> on the ground in this stage of the race, you know. And, and we were leading, and we saw clearly Brunel, which was coming second in that moment. I think, well, I don't know, we were three of us very very close together. Yeah. They decided to go outside and we were still keeping a couple of options. And then when we saw how rough and, you know, and how risky we thought it was, we decided to go outside. And then we had this final 10 hours or whatever they were, so stressful where I think um, it was pain for us for, for a long time. Uh, anyway, the wind shifted to the wrong, the wrong direction and we had to be jiving and they were straight lines that being uh, opposite. One of the things I think is quite cruel about sailing is that um, when you're in the lead, it takes a long time in our sport to get to the finish line. When you are losing, you might still have hours, days to continue to go. When you did see Dongfeng race team in front of you, how long did that final 15 minutes feel like? Well, oh, it was was a sad moment, obviously, and really didn't have a, didn't really want to get there and see everyone. You know, but you know, you, you have to, and we still had the fight with uh, Axel Novel, I think, and yeah. and and Brunel make sure they we would not be. I, I'm actually not sure if Axel Novel beat us in that leg or not. I, I don't remember. Second, they did. They did second. Okay. We were ahead, and they passed us anyway. So, so yeah, well, 
tough moments, but you know, it's, we've lost races so many more times than winning. But, uh, you kind of get used to it, <laughs> even if it's if it, it's not good. But you know, it's, I, I think, uh, and all of us, it wasn't such a drama. I think uh, everyone on board had a good feeling of of the race and mm. say this so many times that they, we had no no problems on the team and. We had the same people on shore and on the boat from the very beginning in Alicante to, to the end of the program. So I think it was a success in all the aspects. And of course, we lost it, which is a massive disappointment. Then you have, to, you know, some people blind small the, the problem in the Southern Ocean. And pretty sure when sometimes you are unlucky, sometimes we were lucky for sure, like Newport, don't forget. So it's, it's fine. It's, it's, it's a good result. And we had a massive fight with Don Fenn and Charles and, and the whole team, and and was uh, good fun, but uh, of course tough, tough to, to lose like this. It's um, almost a little cruel that the results from the last edition just say one, two, three, rather than you know, I mean there was nothing between the you know the performance of these three boats. By the time we got there, it was so close. I, I'm sure that you would like to get out and do the race again. I'm sure that you want to be the person to get the first race win for Spain. I mean, is there anything that you could change about how you raced the last edition? I mean, as you say, a little luck here and there, but you looked so solid and it was so close. Mm. Yeah, again, no, I, I think uh, if you... If... You have to be a little bit uh, tough on yourself. I think uh, the transatlantic was bad. I think uh, we had a plan, which we did the plan we had, but probably we didn't adapt ourselves to the conditions. But anyway, it's, it's, it, now it's so easy. Now we would win every single leg. So. <laughs> okay. It's all right. It's not regrets really to, to what we did uh, as a team for sure and results either. And how to manage how the notion always think, you know, sometimes you think, oh, we probably took it, it you know, easier or, or, or repair or you never know. You know. Yeah. Interesting that you even entertain the idea that maybe you took the Southern Ocean uh, uh, easy or, I mean, 30 minutes between jibes. I mean, that that's a hard working team. Are you, would you jump at the chance? to take your team back to the start line for the next edition? Well, I, I, I wish uh, I wish we could be there, of course. I wish we could be there, but uh, of course, tough, tough moments, uh, these, these moments right now we live in, and um, and it's, it's hard to know the future, to be honest. It's, it's very hard to know the future, and I hope uh, we really, not, not in a bad way, not, absolutely not in a bad way, but we do feel as a team that we have like unfinished business with with this race and, and we very much would like to, to win it as a team with the same structure with Pedro and and, and hopefully with Mafre, but uh, we know where we are and and you know we've been lucky, very lucky <laughs> to be involved in the last five editions. So so you know let's see what happens. Cause at the moment, I mean the next thing that we are scheduled to see you in is the uh, America's Cup with Team Ineos. And, uh, I mean, you guys at the moment, obviously you're in Spain. Uh, the you know Ineos Team GB, it's uh, UK, is uh, back in Britain. But you're still able to do some training. How is that working? Well, you've got a lot of information, I see. But... <laughs> Well, it's it's tough. I think uh, it's it's very tough for an America's camp campaign to to be as we are because uh, you know we we speak about all the effort uh, we put in the in the Volvo Ocean Race, and, which is amazing. Mostly when you are sailing in the America's Cup, the effort before sailing, before even getting sailing, is is just unbelievable. And this situation where we ended up with, you know, we were uh, with a very Nice plan to, to be in, in Sardinia, in Italy, train, try to see where we were with the other teams in, in the racing, was scheduled to do a few weeks uh, past, and, and now nothing is happening, right? So, so nothing is happening in that front, but of course uh, the team is, is doing very well in terms of being, uh, you know, progressing with both two 
this simulator, which I think is what you're referring at, and a lot of work going on there, a lot of work going on there. And, and it's amazing, and it's the future of sailing, I guess. You know, we, we not anymore this uh, test and error and everything in the water and, and two boats and test because the boats are so complicated, so, so complicated that it's pretty much impossible to, to be able to have to two boats full, pre, fully prepared to do a two boat test in a hard decisions to make it a third boat to be built. You know, everything goes so slow. So um, we have to rely on the tools as we always have done and the cap always have done, but it's the, uh, you know, this, these days the, the simulator is a, is a real tool where sailors and, and designers, uh, you know, get this, this common point where, you know, the conversations are more, much more, much more even, let's say, and, and, you know, you can sometimes, not proof, I wouldn't say proof, but you can at least question a few points where, you know, designers are very, very tough to talk to. You've obviously got a lot of sailing left to go and you've done so much already. You're going to continue to inspire people. One of the people that um, I spoke to that was uh, a big fan of yours was Francesca Klapcic from Turn the Tide on Plastic in the last edition. And she's looking to put a team together, um, an Italian team, if she can, for the next edition. She was talking about you as somebody that from her 49er FX sailing, she always looked up to you and Ika and how you would do it. And then as a skipper as well. As a final question for somebody who wants to be a skipper, in the ocean race, what's the one thing? Is there one thing above all else that if you want to be a good skipper, good leader, this is it? I don't know. I, I'm not sure if I, I'm the best uh, person to, to give advice to anyone. But uh, of course, uh, I, I'm sure and I'm aware, I aware that she's uh, working hard to, to find the money and, and to find, you know, put the team together and and she just uh, needs to put the, the best team possible uh, or table to, <laughs> together which she can and then trust and and you know and let, let in my opinion is let the people do what they know doing better than you you know it's, it's impossible one person can be better than anyone else than everyone else in everything so you know I have big names which we haven't even mentioned in this conversation like Rob or or you know and Patan, all these people we had with Blair, really everything because they were, everyone was giving their, their piece and you have to, you know, let them do and, and listen and, and together try to build a team, which is, we always say when sometimes we do some talks or whatever, Mafre or some companies and, and these days is almost on fashion to say teamwork and all this, you know, they encourage to say these words, but in sailing, ocean sailing, this is a team effort. It's nothing you can do on your own, and and you have to trust the people you have around you. And if you don't trust them, you better change them. Shabby, I think that the uh, description that many fans have of you as a very modest skipper, I think that it's accurate. Thank you very much for uh, talking to me today. Thank you very much. One more thing. Yep. We were talking about this when we were young. Oh, that's awesome. No, wait, I want to get another look. No, no, hang on. I want to get another look. Oh, wow. Look at that. <laughs> oh, wow. You are so young. I mean, Man. yeah, that's, that's quite special. <laughs> is that your bib? Is that your race yes. bib? Yes, it is, yes. Oh, wow. That's good. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Xabi Fernandez, a big name from the races past. And of course, still more to come from this Spanish sailing legend in the future, I am sure. If you enjoyed this interview, leave us a review. You can subscribe for more and let us know in the comments below who you want us to talk to next. See you next time.